As I mentioned, during the penetration tests, it's all about following the plan and creating documentation. Those I think you're already comfortable with. The tests should always follow a very specific sequence. The sequence is defined in the plan. It's defined by your scope, by what your, your goals are for the entire penetration test. But following a sequence is important, not just for adherence to plan, but also for ensuring that you've got the right stuff happening at one time. You don't want to start by hacking into the middle of a network and then start enumerating and then start spreading malware and then working back to footprinting. This kind of, you know, back and forth, up and down is unpredictable and it doesn't really help you. It also potentially devalues the process by sending the wrong message. When you're reporting out on this, that kind of up and down, left and right, pseudo random approach to ethical hacking usually connotes the person doesn't know what they're doing. It's a sign of kind of an amateur. So having a sequence and following the sequence that's been laid out for you in this series of videos of first enumerating and footprinting, passive, active, and then actually getting into, you know, penetration one step at a time, looking for vulnerabilities, assessing, then mapping out, documenting, all of those things, there's a very, very specific reason for it. And that's why you need to be following it. If you don't agree with the sequence, you should define a different sequence before you begin and ensure that your sequence is part of the plan and then you follow whatever sequence you feel is best. Or alternately, as a, or in combination with that, what I would recommend is documenting, hey, I may go in and out of sequence a little bit here and there based on what I find. If I'm footprinting, I'm going to footprint first. And then when I get into actual penetration, I may do a little bit more footprinting. That's cool. Document that as part of the plan and adhere to that, whatever it is. There's certainly some flexibility based on your expertise, but you get a lot more confidence from the target if you're following the plan. Part of the documentation up front and part of the agreement is the type of penetration test. And we covered this a little bit in the very first video where we talked about the different types of penetration tests, but I didn't get into a lot of detail. This is where there's a little bit more detail provided because this is where you need to know what type of penetration test you're performing as part of the agreement with the client, whether it's a black box test, a white box test, or a gray box test. The black box penetration test is simply put, you can't see into the box. That's why it's called a black box test. You don't know what's going on in the network. You have very, very basic information about our website is www.bigmoneybank.com, and we want to test vulnerabilities on databases and web servers, and that's it. That's the information you get about the target. You certainly still get scope, you still get parameters, you still get timelines, but you don't get exhaustive documentation about what the network looks like or what the servers are running or how they're connected or anything like that. This is a very, very close simulation to an outside attacker with no pre-knowledge, the type of attack that they'll commit because there's a lot of footprinting and enumeration involved. There's a lot of, of initial exploration and you have to go really slow when you're trying to find some of this stuff. So it's very expensive for the client, but it's also the best simulation of a real world attack. On the other hand, white box penetration tests are almost the exact opposite where extensive documentation is provided. So in that same scenario, Big Money Bank wants you to test their databases and web front ends. They're going to tell you the names of the database servers, the names of the web servers, how they're connected to each other. They may give you login credentials. They may not. They'll probably tell you a lot about the communications channels, a lot about where the firewalls are, maybe where the honeypots are. Those are great bits of information to have. They make the ethical hacking approach much faster because you don't have to learn a lot of that stuff. It's typically not fake. It's not that they're trying to fake you out. They just want the process to be faster and more efficient. They want you to spend less time actually doing the enumeration and more time beating the systems up to see if you can get in. This is also a really good example of maybe an IT person um, that's turned counter IT person, an IT person attacking the systems from the inside. Maybe a DBA is suspected of doing some bad things, and after they're dismissed, they want you, the client wants you to have the same information that the DBA had to see if you can actually hack the systems. That's a, that's a pretty common example.
And it's also used if they want to scope down the security test. They only want to test this, or they only want to test that, or they have different companies testing different components and they want you to test this. That's great. White box penetration tests are fine like that. They are much more efficient uh, and less likely to be caught. At the other hand, they're not as close to a simulation of an outside attacker as the black box penetration test would be. Most common is the gray box penetration test. And the gray box penetration test is a hybrid of the black box and white box penetration test, where some information is divulged at the outset. So not just we want you to attack our web servers or we want you to penetration test our database servers, but things like here's the FQDNs of these servers or those servers, or here's the IP range, here's DNS, but not too much information, like here's login information and here's versioning for, for our servers and clients. That kind of balance is almost always what you get in these in these tests. Again, it's critical to define that right up front. Most clients don't really want to hear black box, gray box, white box. They just want to define upfront what information they will give you, what information they won't give you. In a consultative role, oftentimes I'll recommend, hey, it, it just depends on what you're trying to test, what you're trying to find out. If you're trying to simulate a real true outside attacker coming in and having to figure out everything, especially if they're in another part of the world, Black box is probably closer to what you want to go to, but I don't usually use the term black box. I'll say you want I, you want me to start with no pre-knowledge versus we're worried about insider attacks. Great. Then you probably want me to actually start with more knowledge and focus my efforts more on using that knowledge for bad things, the knowledge that a typical person in that role might have. So the, the terms themselves not as important for client agreement as they are for us understanding the scope.